Good evening. It's good to see everyone back out tonight for a continued period of worship. I'm going to ask you I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We're going to spend our time together looking at a few verses at the end of that chapter. This morning as as Jeremy was presenting his lesson, he, he talked about God giving us the very best way the very best way for a marriage to thrive, specific to his lesson this morning. And I liked how he presented that, and as I was thinking about that with my lesson this evening, I think about the books of of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes as God doing that for us. He is giving us the very best way to live. And so much of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes is just full of very practical ways in which God looks down on man and is helping show us the very best ways to live, the very best ways to thrive, the very best ways to grow closer to him, and and the pitfalls that we have to watch out for as we go throughout our lives. And I think that's what's happening in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 as well, and we're going to talk specifically this evening about something that we see in this chapter, something that can be either a severe evil, it's the language that we're going to look at here in just a second, or something that can be good and fitting for us. Now the interesting thing is, is that which can be severe evil is the very same thing that can be good and fitting for us. And we're going to talk about what the Ecclesiastes writer has to say about those things and the applications that can be made to us. So let's read this together, and then we'll dive into this text. We're going to begin in verse number 13 of Ecclesiastes chapter 5. There is a severe evil which I have seen under the sun, Riches kept for their owner to his hurt. But those riches perish through misfortune. When he begets a son, there's nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. And he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a severe evil. Just exactly as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he who has labored for the wind? All his days he also eats in darkness, and he has much sorrow and sickness and anger. Here's what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor, which he toils under the sun, all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life, Because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. And chapter 6 actually continues to build upon these same thoughts. We're going to reference a verse or two in that chapter here in just a moment. But for now, we're going to stop at the end of chapter 5. Did you pick up on the two extremes? The severe evil, he mentions it twice, essentially reiterating the same thing the severe evil, and that which is good and fitting. These two extremes that the writer is keen in on. But as we read, I hope you realized that the things under the heading of a severe evil and the things under the heading of good and fitting are exactly the same. What changes and what makes them either a severe evil or good and fitting 
is the way that we approach them. And, and that's what I want us to talk about this evening. A as the Ecclesiastes writer talks about the wealth that man has, the comforts, the luxuries, the money, the resources that we have, he recognizes the danger of these things. And he recognizes how they can become a severe evil for us. He says, first of all, there at the very outset of this text, in verse number 13, that he sees these things as, as a severe evil because they are kept for their owner's hurt. Kept for their owner's hurt. I want you to think about that. Think about our lives. Think about the things that we have. Think about the accumulation of wealth that our society values. Think about our desire for luxury and for ease. Think about how those things can be accumulated all in the name of making our lives better. Making our lives more comfortable. Making our lives easier. If I just get a little bit more, then I can heal the pain. If I get just a little bit more, then I can solve these problems. If I get just a little bit more, then I can finally put my mind at ease. But the easier our lives get, the unhealthier we get. The easier our lives get, the more anxious we become. The easier our lives get, the more weakened we become in mind, body, and spirit. We accumulate and we accumulate and accumulate in the name of making our lives better, making our lives easier, and all it brings is worry and temptation and anxiety. And the reason is, is because the riches are kept for their owner's hurt. The accumulation of riches, the collection of wealth, is not going to solve the problems in our lives. It is not going to heal the pain in our lives. The Ecclesiastes writer looks out as he himself has experimented with, with wealth beyond our wildest imagination. And he realizes that this can be a severe evil when these things are kept for their owner's hurt. The NIV will translate that as wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner. And I think all of us can either relate to that or can certainly understand the concept of the desire that our culture has to hoard wealth, to accumulate things, thinking that it will make life better only to realize that it is to our harm. There's another way in which this can be a severe evil. It's when those riches perish through misfortune. When reliance is placed upon wealth and things and riches, when everything about who you are and what you stand for is founded on a foundation of wealth or on a foundation of stuff, and that stuff fails, it perishes through misfortune. These things are a severe evil to us at that point. They only bring us harm. There is no benefit found in those circumstances. In verse number 17, we get a sad picture. As the Ecclesiastes writer, again, looking at someone who treats wealth and sees wealth as something to be accumulated for good, and yet all his days he eats in darkness. Such a vivid picture being painted there. And he has much sorrow and sickness and anger. 
we get a picture of someone who is lonely, someone who is depressed, someone who is sick and mad at the world. Why? Because of the obsessive longing for wealth the desire to accumulate things and the unfortunate reality that they have built their very existence upon those things. And when that happens, when our, when our mindset, our attitude towards wealth leads us down this path, these things are a severe evil to us. But... The writer then takes a little bit of a turn as he looks down and he also sees a way in which these can be good and fitting for us. And as we read just a moment ago, as he paints the picture now of someone who has accumulated a certain amount of wealth, works hard for everything that they have, the same way that the one who, who, is, who is under that guise of severe evil because of their wealth, now there is someone who has accumulated wealth and works hard for everything that they have, and it is good and fitting for them. Why is that? It's because of the attitude that we see towards those things. This person has developed a healthy attitude towards earthly blessings, a healthy attitude toward physical wealth. We get the picture here in this part of the text that they have worked very hard for these things. And they enjoy it. They celebrate it. They have have found happiness in some of these things. Not because of the wealth, but because of their attitude towards it. Because let's not forget, as we get down to verse number 19, that this is a gift from God. Everything that we have, the the ability to work, the, the ability to buy a home, the ability to clothe ourselves. It's a gift from God. And it's important that we train our minds to have the proper attitude towards those things. Because that is what makes the difference between them being a severe evil in our lives and something that is good and fitting for us. In verse number 20, again, we get the impression that this is someone... This is someone who who is not caught up in the physical world around them. He won't dwell, he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life. Because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. He's developed a a healthy respect for the world around him. He's recognized that the physical world it provides me with what I need while I'm here, and there is some, some happiness and some joy and some excitement that can be had while I'm here that God wants me to enjoy, but, but I have a healthy perspective of these things. I'm not going to dwell too much on the days of my life, because as the Ecclesiastes writer is famous for, those days go by very quickly. They're like a vapor, and they're gone. Don't dwell too much on this physical world. But while you're here, see it for what it is, a gift from God, and enjoy it. Enjoy that gift that God has given to us. I mentioned that chapter 6 really continues on with this train of thought, and I want to bring your attention to to one thing that is said there in verse 3 and in verse number 7 as we get down into chapter 6. If a man begets a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with goodness, or indeed he has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better than he. Verse 7, all the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the soul is not satisfied. See, in order for the physical blessings... 
that each of us have that God intends for us to enjoy while in our possession, we have to learn contentment. We have to learn to be satisfied with what we have. We have to develop that proper mindset that, that I can be happy and satisfied and content with whatever my stage in life is. And when we train our minds in that way, that's when we unlock the door to joy and to happiness in the days that God gives us here on this earth. Because whether with a lot or a little, I'm happy and I'm content and I'm joyful and I enjoy the time that God has given me here on this earth. But we have to learn to be content and to be satisfied with what we have in order for these physical blessings that we enjoy to truly be good and fitting for us. One of my favorite movies, I, I think I've said this, well, uh, one of my favorite movies is Cool Runnings. You guys seen that movie? You guys familiar with the movie that I'm talking about? I love that movie. It's great. Great movie. If you haven't watched it, go home tonight and watch it. But it's the movie about a Jamaican bobsled team. It's kind of an older movie, 90s, which I guess for, for a lot of us is not that old, but for some of you, it's an older movie. It's about a Jamaican bobsled team. And this group of sprinters from Jamaica make their way to the Winter Olympics to be the first Jamaican bobsled team. And they are trained by a reluctant coach who used to be a bobsledder in his own right and won two gold medals as an Olympic bobsledder, but was stripped of those medals because he cheated. And there is a scene in that movie as this Jamaican bobsled team is preparing for their last run in their Olympic event that the driver of that sled has a one-on-one -on -one conversation in private with his coach, and he wants to know why his coach cheated. And his coach responds to him, and he said, I cheated because I just had to win. I just had to win. And he, the, the bobsledder pushes back just a little bit and says, y you won two gold medals, wasn't that enough? And, and the coach tells him, he tells him this line that has stuck with me from the very first time I watched this movie. He said, if you're not enough without them, you'll never be enough with them. I thought about that as I was reading Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We, we oftentimes, our culture and our society wants to push upon us the need to accumulate wealth and the need to, to build up our bank accounts as high as we can get them. If you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. And that's one of the points that I think God is wanting us to see as we think about our mindset and our attitude towards the physical blessings that God gives to us. There's nothing wrong with wealth. There's nothing wrong in my movie analogy with winning gold medals. They're great. It's the pinnacle of the sport. But if you're not enough without them, you'll never be enough with them. And God wants us to take that concept and to use that way of thinking as we approach the world that we live in. As we think about our jobs, as we think about our families, as we think about our homes, as we think about the clothes that we wear and the cars that we drive and the food that we eat, there's nothing wrong with, with celebrating and enjoying all that we have before us. But don't ever fall into the trap of thinking that those things are going to heal the pain that you're feeling. Those things are, are never going to feel, fill the void that you feel in your heart. 
those things are never going to take you from, and I'm really, I'm really down all the time, and I'm lost, and I'm confused, and I don't know about my relationship with God, and I don't know about my relationship with my wife or my children, but if I could get a promotion at work, if I could make just a little bit more money so that we could afford to get away every now and then, if you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. The writer of Ecclesiastes sees this as such a huge obstacle for mankind that, that most of the book centers around these concepts. As he tries to help us today, thousands of years after this was written, to navigate the physical world in which we live and to make sure that all of the physical blessings that God has given to us, the gifts that he has put in our lives, that they can be good and fitting for us. That we don't fall into the trap of those things becoming severe evil. Because if we do, what we are doing is we are wasting God's gifts. We are wasting what he has given us to be pleasurable, to be enjoyable, and we are turning them into something that he never intended for them to be by the way we approach them, and by the attitude that we have. As Christians and as followers of Christ, we should never shy away from earthly success. We should never shy away from physical wealth. We aren't in any way called to be destitute in order to be righteous. We're called instead to develop the right attitude towards those things. And when we do that, they can be a great blessing to us as individuals, They can be a great blessing to our families, to our friends, to the community around us. And we can truly unlock their potential in our lives. And we can enjoy life, and we can enjoy the good of our labor. We have to be cautious not to let those things become a severe evil. By hoarding them. By putting too much trust and too much confidence in them. By obsessing over those things or by thinking in some way that it will solve the problems of our lives. It's up to each of us to develop contentment, to develop generosity, to develop joy around these things, so that we can truly experience God's gifts in the way that he intends for us to. This is a lifelong endeavor for all of us. Each day, we have the responsibility of approaching the world around us in a righteous way. Because the world around us can draw us closer to God when we recognize what it truly is. That each day that we wake up, it is a gift from God and an opportunity that he has presented to us to draw closer to him, to be a shining light in the community that we are in, and to be a good example for those that are around us. We can do that by the way that we approach the physical things of our life. Well, if you're here this evening, I want to challenge you to think for just a second as we close, to take the principle that we talked about this evening, uh, about having contentment, about being satisfied, about being enough without those things, And I want you to think about your relationship to God as we leave here this evening. God has given us this world to enjoy, to admire, to appreciate, because it shows us his power. It shows us his handiwork. And it gives us a glimpse of what God has in store for us eternally. Because this world, too, is also full of sadness. It's also full of grief. And we long for a day in which that's all gone. We long for a day in which joy reigns supreme. We long for a day in which death is no longer. We long for a day in which we can all rejoice together for all of eternity. And that's the promise that God has made to those who are faithful to him those who are righteous, those who are his. 
And he has given all of us the opportunity to become a part of his family and to have that hope of one day living eternally with him in heaven. But the beauty of that promise and the beauty of that opportunity that God has put before us is we don't have to wait until heaven to experience the joy of being in a relationship with him. We can have that right now. We can have the comfort of being a child of God's right now. We can have the joy of having our sins forgiven right now. And we can have the excitement of being in relationship with God right now. And it's an opportunity that he has given to all of us. So I challenge all of us to think about where we are in that relationship with God. To think about if there are things, if there are changes that we need to make to make sure as we leave here this evening that we can experience God's gifts in every way that he intends for us to, whether it be the physical things of this world or the relationship that he offers to each of us. So if we can help you in any way, please come to the front and let us know how as we stand.